Welcome to the entire Bible for everybody from atheists to Christian believers. This is session number eight on Daniel and the Second Temple Period. My name is Pastor Richard Matheson, and here are the assigned readings for session number eight on Second Temple Judaism. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is session eight, the entire Bible for everybody from atheists to Christian believers. Section eight on Daniel and the Second Temple Period. And that's me in November 20th. And it's based on that theory of what modern people want to know, what the Bible really says, and much of that is in the readings. And I appreciate those of you who uh, have been doing the readings and tell me how much it helped them. And then the Bible explained in modern language of science, like what is true? What, can, what light can all of modern science show about the Bible? And that's uh, what I will be doing in my lectures, obviously. Okay, there was an overview and then eight sections, four in the New Testament, four in the Old with assigned readings. And right now, you know, we did three on the New Testament, and then we switched, because we're not going to finish up the New Testament until that summary next week. And that's because there's a book there called Revelation, which is a very weird book, and you can't really understand Revelation unless you talk about Daniel, which is our subject for today. So we did an introduction to the Old Testament, the monarchy, the prophets, and now we're up to the final part of the Old Testament. And what we're going to be doing is uh, discussing the important book of the prophet Daniel, which will introduce new concepts that link the Old Testament to the New Testament and helps us to make sense of that book called Revelation in the New Testament. So Daniel uh, is about the end times. The end times in Christian theology is the uh, uh, second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. Now both Judaism and Christianity have the end times and the resurrection of the dead and the concept of the Messiah and how that might relate. And there's another thing coming up especially in Daniel and the first century Judaism called apocalyptic Judaism of the first century, which was the time of Jesus and Paul. And apocalyptic Judaism is the belief that the world is coming to an end soon, okay? In some kind of a cataclysmic end, the second coming, the uh, resurrection of the dead, but it's that idea of it happening soon, and we'll be talking about that today. So Second Temple Judaism, we have a book I call the Apocalypse of Daniel, just like Revelation is a translation of the word apocalypse. The Greek name is apocalypse. And the resurrection of the dead, the end times, the Messiah, and Second Temple Judaism in this uh, uh, perception or this perspective called apocalyptic Judaism. Why is the Old Testament so important? Well, we've talked about that a lot. It's about monotheism, morality, and prophecy about a coming Messiah, all of them essential to Christianity. Some Christian believers think that Jesus is all that matters, the New Testament, and maybe Jesus could have been born anywhere, and I say, Nope, because Jesus' message was entirely dependent on the Old Testament and monotheism, theism, morality, and the concept of a Messiah or anointed one. Jesus could have appeared only in two places in the Mediterranean world, Judea or Galilee, because they're the only two places where monotheism, <coughs> meaning Judaism, was well established. And of course, he was born in Bethlehem in Judea, and raised and preached in Galilee. 
where Judeo-Christian morality was also well established. They're very important to the message of Jesus. And it's a topic about which Christian believers and atheists may differ, I think. Christian believers would assume that Jesus being born in monotheistic Judea, Judea was part of God's plan. Atheists or skeptics might assume that it was entirely accidental. And that's going to be a recurring question that we'll talk about. How can we uh, look at it both ways for those who want to look at it both ways? Okay, Second Temple Judaism, the Apocalypse of Daniel, Resurrection of Dead End Times, Messiah and Apocalypse Judaism. And Second Temple Judaism is this period from the coming of Cyrus at the end of the Babylonian uh, exile and the 600 years all the way to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's a little over 600 years. That's what we're going to be talking about today when we get really started. Okay, second. Now, I also began talking much more last time about oral versus written culture because it's become important. And the main story of Judaism is told in its first five books called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. And the oral culture is the first four books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and then the written culture is called Deuteronomy. Now, what do we mean by that? The oral culture, those four books, the written culture, because we know when Deuteronomy was discovered according to 2 Kings chapters 22 and 20. It was discovered in 621 BC. Now, remember, by that time, Judaism was probably at least 400 years old and more like 600. We can take the Ten Commandments as an example. Here's what Exodus says about the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. The operative word is spoke. Okay? And the same thing for those other four. Deuteronomy chapter 5, God spoke these words, and then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. This is Moses speaking. That's a written culture. And that's a very significant change, and it's tied into the message of the prophets in a way we'll be looking at. So monotheism, one God, seems to go far back into the oral culture of ancient Israelites and proto-Israelites. Proto is the ancestors. Uh, and the oral culture of ancient Israel was a powerful story, even if much of it cannot be corroborated. This is the story of the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan. And Jewish scholar Jacob Neusner describes it as the foundational story, the Passover story. I came across this just since last week, and I just thought he said things better than I can say them, and he has a little more authority than I do about Judaism. But... Uh, that is the burning bush of Moses, the Exodus, uh, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. That's the Ten Commandments. This is Jacob Neusner, and here's the book that I just, I had this before and I just read it. Judaism when Christianity began. And he is really trying to look at them together, Judaism, Christianity, and say it as accurately as possible. And here's what he said. What do we mean by Judaism? Judaism, quote unquote, is a religion. And a religion, whatever else it is, is a story. Our story. A religion is a story that a group tells to explain where it has come from, where it is going, what it is in accordance with God's plan. People who tell themselves that story form the faithful of a religion, which would be Judaism telling the Passover story. 
It is also the story of Christianity, as I will get to. The Passover story. When the faithful of Judaism gather at the formal meal or Seder. How many of you have ever been to a Passover Seder? A couple, okay. Uh, to celebrate Passover, when the Israelite slaves led by Moses were freed by God from Egyptian slavery, Jews get together, tell the story, and they say in the narrative of the Passover Seder, this is quoting Nussbaum, Passover Seder, it's always done in the home. Christians think in terms of uh, a church service. The Passover story is told in the home. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord our God brought us forth from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And if the Holy One, meaning God, blessed be he, had not brought our fathers forth from Egypt, then we and our descendants would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. So we should be obligated to repeat again and again the story of the exodus from Egypt every Passover. So, Neusner on the salvation story. That is the Passover. This is going from uh, slavery in Egypt, you know, the Exodus, the Red Sea. And then after that comes the decline, or you could call it disaster, the sad story of the monarchy. And then finally the return to Jerusalem with Cyrus the Great. This is the story of Judaism. And it's also the story of Christianity because Christianity accepts the Hebrew scriptures of Judaism as being holy scripture. There is nobody who can accurately say that, well, the New Testament is what we believe, but not the Old Testament. They are so linked together that they, uh, are, they are also considered holy scripture by Christians, the Old Testament. Okay, the result of the Passover story is the ancestors of Israel after Moses at the burning bush, the ten plagues, the opening of the Red Sea, and eventually under Joshua, according to the Bible, conquer the land of Israel, establish the united monarchy of King Saul, David, and Solomon. And we know when that happened, right? We've talked about 1000 BC. What can be scientifically corroborated? Well, the conquest of Israel and setting up the monarchy happened. That's a solid date. And we know the first mention of Israel outside the Bible was 1208, at which time the proto-Israelites, that's the ancestors of Israel, that's 200 years before they found the state, the nation, were already living in the hill country by 1208. We can't, cannot corroborate the remainder of the story of the, you know, the plagues of the uh, Red Sea opening, but we cannot disprove it either. And this is the hill country and that brown area, we've talked about this before, that's where there were Israelites already by 1208. And I'm not going to go. Anyway, monotheism comes from the original oral culture. Morality comes from the writing prophets reacting to the rise of three empires, all pushing a written language of Aramaic. And that was the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the Neo-Babylonian, and the Persian. They are all unifying the ancient world with one language, Aramaic which is a close relationship, but different from Hebrew. So we had the united monarchy, that's Saul, David, and Solomon, and then it splits, and the northern kingdom will collapse to the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and the prophets interpret it. And then there's a quiet period of about 70 years, and then the Babylonian Empire, the Neo-Babylonian, arises, and the southern kingdom collapses to the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and the prophets interpret that. And finally, we have the Babylonian exile. So the writing prophets established morality. And then later on, we'll see that Deuteronomy codified it in about 621 BC. OK, the Babylonian captivity, when the, the elite the top people 
of Judea, of Jerusalem, were carried off into captivity in Babylon was considered a horrifying experience because all seemed lost. Their temple, that's the first temple, had been destroyed. But the prophets interpreted it, and there was a surprise coming. Cyrus the Great, Emperor in Persia, returned the Jewish people from Babylonian captivity to build the second temple in Jerusalem, which is our subject for today. That's Ezra returning to Jerusalem from Babylonian exile, celebrating. And here you can see the monarchy period in First Temple from 1000 all the way to 532. And the red area is the Babylonian exile. And then Cyrus brings them back and they rebuild the second temple. And that's a 600 year period from 532 so there's like 530 years plus 70, and in 70 AD, the second temple is destroyed. And Judaism changes forever into something called rabbinic Judaism after 70 AD. So uh, with the return of the Jewish exiles to Jerusalem, the Bible's history lesson ends. The Jerusalem temple was rebuilt. The second temple era began. And the Second Temple era will last to 70 AD, past the time of Jesus and Paul. So the Judaism that Jesus knew was Second Temple Judaism, what we're talking about today. And the same for Paul. The Judaism that Paul knew was Second Temple Judaism, not Rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism of today. So that's a first century Jesus of Nazareth and Paul of Tarsus. And there's that 600 year period. But before we go further, we want to review briefly monotheism, morality, and the concept of Messiah. And the history of civilization is split into two halves before Jesus and after. The green is before BC and the yellow is AD. And uh, last week we talked about the Old Testament writing prophets and the importance of writing being very important. And Judaism deserves high praise from Christians for its message about monotheism and morality, as well as the Messiah. And ancient Judaism solved the two biggest challenges, monotheism and morality, and laid the groundwork for an understanding of the Messiah. So they agree, Judaism and Christy agree about monotheism and morality, and they have different ideas about the Messiah because Christian believers believe the Messiah is coming. His name is Jesus. Jewish believers believe the Messiah has not yet come, and they wait. But Jewish believers and Christian believers both expect a resurrection of the dead at the end times. Okay? I'm just trying to keep a joint perspective of Judaism and Christianity. Okay, we talked about that. The most important historical date is 1000 BC. That's King David. It's a solid historical date. Anything in the Bible before 1000 BC is mostly uncorroborated, according to modern science. But uh, almost everything after 1000 BC, we can corroborated historically. It doesn't mean all the details are correct, like Bathsheba or miracles, but the Bible's timeline of kings and prophets match up to historical records. So we'll look at Judaism, the Old Testament, divided into four time periods, which are prehistoric, before 1000, monarchy 1000 to 532, that's King David to Cyrus, and uh, and then Second Temple Judaism, our subject for today. So uh, monarchy Judaism was also the time of the prophets. And the monarchy period, the writing prophets were from 750 to 500 BC. And corroboration, generally within the monarchy period, the corroboration is good. Before 1000, not so much. And in fact, after 
When we get to the Second Temple Judaism, we have a lot of trouble matching up things. You would think it would be, well, we'll talk about that. So monarchy Judaism uh, had these, the unified monarchy, that's David and Solomon, the northern kingdom, which is going to crash and fall to the Neo-Assyrians, and then the southern kingdom was going to crash and fall to the Neo-Babylonians, and finally the Babylonian exile. So where does morality come from in the Old Testament? And it comes from the writing prophets. And here they are. There's 15 of them, three major, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, 12 minor. But the writing prophets are split between some about the Assyrian period and some about the Babylonian and Persian period. And it helps immensely to understand them if you know that. And so that's the sad story. The kings are all rated as good or bad, and we've talked about that. The message of the prophets is about the Sinai covenant, a disobedience. The prophets are criticizing both the northern kingdom and southern kingdom for disobeying God's law, doing bad things to the widows and orphans, and the uh, uh, you know, misusing the temple, worshiping incorrectly, the need for repentance, hope for forgiveness, and the anointed one, the Messiah. So anyway, ancient Israel was in a tough neighborhood, and there's Israel, and you can see Egypt down there. There's Assyria that's gonna conquer the whole northern kingdom. And there's Babylon that's going to conquer the southern kingdom. And then there's Persia that's going to conquer the Babylonians and let them return to Jerusalem. And so these three empires, Neo-Assyria, Neo-Babylonian, and Persian, are about to change the entire history of the world. And they're pushing writing. And that activates the writing prophets, although they're pushing Aramaic language, and the writing prophets, of course, are going to write in Hebrew. Okay, and then later on we'll come to Alexander from Greece, and eventually to Rome. So we've got this period, and uh, these are repeats. Yeah, you can see the unified monarchy, then the northern kingdom has its problems, the southern kingdom and the Babylonian exile. The northern kingdom meets the Neo-Assyrian Empire and gets wiped off the map. Here's Tiglath Pileser, the Neo-Assyrian from 745. Notice the time period, it's 750 to 700. Sets out to conquer the world by writing, or at least unify it. King Sargon uses the Aramaic language as a tool of conquest, and the Israelite prophets react Amos, about 750 B.C., Hosea, about 745, Micah, about 727, and the first part of Isaiah between 747 and 701. And the Assyrian era prophets will interpret the Neo-Assyrian threat not the way you expect, oh, we should fight the Neo-Assyrians. No. The prophets say Yahweh is punishing the northern kingdom. And prophets such as Amos are very well informed, and their concern is always about Israel's morality. So scholar Klaus Koch divides them into the Assyrian era prophets and the Babylonian and Persian, which helped me immensely. Here is about the Assyrian era prophets. Amos. Uh, preached in the northern kingdom, and he says, uh, the king of the northern kingdom shall surely die, and the northern kingdom shall be deported, wiped off the map. And that's what happened. And Hosea says essentially the same thing, and it happened, that's Hosea. And Micah says the same thing, that's Micah. And then first Isaiah. Summary, Neo-Assyrian Empire prophets 
wrote between 750 and 701, accused the northern kingdom of sinfulness and predicted that the northern kingdom would be conquered by the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and it happened. Then, uh, this is the writing problem, the fact that they wrote in the Hebrew alphabetic language is very important as opposed to Aramaic. This type of writing is very new in history. And the fact that the huge and powerful empire is using a written language as a deliberate strategy is important, and the prophet's writing in vernacular Hebrew is important. So there's the Assyrians, and meanwhile, when the, when the northern kingdom is destroyed, it affects the southern kingdom, King Hezekiah, the southern kingdom, because the Assyrian conquest produces a huge refugee flow into, southern, into the southern kingdom, and it fires more writing down a little bit later. But Hezekiah is the first time a lot of the Bible manuscripts get pulled together. So here's the sad story. Prophecy stops. I never realized this, but the prophecy stops for about 70 years. Peaceful Neo-Assyrian rule. And then the rise of the Neo-Babylonian Empire comes along. And he, he's going to be talking about the Babylonian and Persian prophets. So King Nabopolassar of the Neo-Babylonian Empire from 626 to 605 founds the Neo-Babylonian, pushes Aramaic again. King Nebuchadnezzar, probably the most famous of the Babylonians, uh, 605 to 562, he conquers the southern kingdom, destroyed the temple, and took the leadership into exile. This is the Babylonian hanging gardens. They were great builders. That's Ishtar Gate. See how small the people look? And the Babylonian ziggurat. But here are the writing prophets for the Babylonian period. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, second part of Isaiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Joel, Obadiah, and Habakkuk. But they all have a similar message. Uh, and then it happens, the discovery of the written book of Deuteronomy in 621 by King Josiah causes its own major revolution in Judaism by centralizing worship and destroying sin. So there's Jeremiah, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. He, Jeremiah says the boiling water pot from the north, meaning the Neo-Babylonian Empire, is going to punish the southern kingdom. Your ways have brought Yahweh's wrath upon you. And the result was the Babylonian conquest and exile. And Jeremiah also begins to prepare the possibility of repentance. But he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the ruler. Habakkuk has a similar message. You have installed Nebuchadnezzar. And Obadiah, about the day of Yahweh, similar. And Zephaniah and Ezekiel. And uh, Ezekiel, the temple on wheels. Second Isaiah. Now, once Babylonians conquer the southern kingdom and take everybody into exile, the prophet's message changes dramatically. Remember, they have been accusing the northern and southern kingdom of sinfulness all along. Now, uh, you see prophet Isaiah after the, uh, the Babylon or during the Babylonian, comfort, comfort my people, make a highway through the desert to return back to Jerusalem. Now it's a message of hope. Now, of course, there had always been a message about the Messiah, but the whole tone of the prophets changes to a very positive tone. And the Babylonian exile, 48 years, captivity, everything seemed lost, but the prophets interpreted it. And according to the prophets, God had a surprise, which was Cyrus, bringing them back to Jerusalem. 
And he also pursued the policy of the Aramaic written language, just as the two previous empires had done. Ezra returned, there's the second temple period, and now the second temple period begins, and there are writing prophets after the Babylonian exile, third Isaiah, the spirit is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to proclaim to captives a year of release and an opening to those in bondage in Babylon. Haggai rebuilds the temple in Jerusalem after the exile, that's Haggai. Zechariah rebuilds the second temple and there's Zechariah, Malachi, and that's Malachi. And so why are the prophets important? They interpreted Israel's history, or specifically, they interpret the way God intervened in Israel's history. Now, of course, to a, an atheist or skeptic, these are all accidental things, the, even the fact that each of these prophecies turned out to be correct. So what message do they have about the Sinai Covenant? Condemning the Israelites for disobedience, need for repentance, hope for forgiveness, and the Anointed One. So the prophet's interpretation of history, the Neo-Assyrian conquest of the Northern Kingdom was Yahweh's punishment for its sins, the Neo-Babylonian conquest of the Southern Kingdom was Yahweh's punishment for its sins, and Cyrus's Persian conquest of Babylon that ended the Babylonian exile and allowed the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem was Yahweh's decision. That's their interpretation. So those are the four periods, and we're gonna be talking now about the Second Temple Judaism. Why did I place so much emphasis on the writing prophets? Because the writing policies of the three empires uh, changed everything and, and seem to have spurred the writing prophets. Now remember, ancient Israel was an oral culture, storytelling culture, not a writing culture. The main story was always the Passover story, told orally until Josiah's discovery of the book of Deuteronomy in 621 BC. Okay, I'm gonna be talking now about the second kingdom the big events are Cyrus, who re returned the Jews to Jerusalem. 200 years later, Alexander the Greek conquers the whole area and brings in the Greek language with a whole other set of consequences. And then about 165, the book of Daniel is written and has a huge impact. Here's what happens. Uh, Alexander the Great, he brings in the Greek language, Greek culture, Greek polis, that's the way cities are set up in Greece, Greek religion, which is polytheistic, right? We know it's polytheistic. Greece has a very powerful culture, and you know that because we still honor it, right? The great uh, Parthenon, the architecture, the uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the philosophy, the, uh, uh, the great dramatists, you know, uh, Euripides and Sophocles, and, and, uh, and I mean, I could go on and on. And whenever they conquered an area, the upper crust was blown away and very much influenced towards accepting Greek ideas. And one of the most important is this Greek polis. Uh, that, that is a city. Greek cities, remember, were democratically run, right? This is, this is way back in the time of uh, democracy. Uh, even though Alexander was from Mount Macedonia, <laughs> and it was not, but, but uh, and to have democracy, it meant they had to have a list of voters who were eligible to vote. Remember, this is a slave culture, right? Greece is a slave culture. All of these cultures are slave. And, and uh, if, if you wanted to become truly a citizen of Greece, 
Then what you did is you set up a city with a polis, you know, a political change of form of government, and, uh, and then you would bring in the Greek education, it's called paideia, and the Greek uh, uh, gymnasiums, you know, with nude bathing, and, and Greek uh, customs, which were very different from the Judean. And, and, of course, Greek religion. So, other impacts of Alexander the Great, we have the Jewish diaspora, you know, because they had already begun to spread, you know, they went to Babylon, but uh, one of the things that happened was there was a great dispersion down into Egypt. Alexandria at one point had, I think, one million Jews after, after it was founded by Alexander and named after him. The translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, it's called the Septuagint. It was supposedly done by 70 scholars. But that becomes very important because in the New Testament time, most people, even Jewish people, didn't know the Hebrew scriptures, they knew the Greek version. And there was an international language now of Greek which we know very well because the New Testament is all written in Greek, not in Hebrew. And uh, Alexander, like Cyrus, uh, had a very uh, strong tendency towards religious toleration, partly because he picked it up from Cyrus, as we'll see. That's a picture of Alexander. Oh, this is the Phine I'm just showing the connection between Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. They all have 22 consonants, and Hebrew and Ara Aramaic have no vowels, but Greek added in five vowels. They're all related, but different languages. Here's the guy, uh, the, the, this is after Alexander died, uh, the uh, area of Israel came under the rule of the Ptolemies, the Greek Ptolemies, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, and he is credited with translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. He was a Greek ruler of Egypt and Palestine, credited with sponsoring the translation. The story is, and it can never be verified, but that his librarian, you know, the librarian of the Alexandria Library, which was the biggest in the world, said, oh, there's one thing missing. We don't have the, the Hebrew scriptures. So they commissioned the writing. That's a legend, but it's not entirely improbable. So we had Cyrus, Alexander, Daniel, and we had also, then we're going to be coming to the book of Daniel, which is an apocalypse, a revelation, written at a time of extreme persecution. The persecution led to a rebellion against the Greeks, and the book of Daniel had a huge impact on Judaism that we're going to talk about. Now, there were many of these so-called apocalyptic books, but there's only one in the official Old Testament canon. It increased expectations of a Messiah, an anointed one, for reasons we'll see. And it's the only direct mention of the resurrection of the dead in Hebrew scriptures. In other words, until the Second Temple Judaism, he, the Jewish religion did not have a doctrine about the resurrection of the dead at the end time. That is going to be new. And, uh, and the book of Daniel is a very important uh, carrier for that idea. Here is uh, a quote from the book of Daniel. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Son of man gets to be a very important topic in the New Testament. And he came to the Ancient of Days, which is God, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, 
and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's Daniel 7, uh, uh, verses 13 to 14. This is the, the Old Testament. And, and this is a artist's interpretation of one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds. This vision of a Son of Man coming on the clouds became very powerful to the Jews of the Second Temple period. Uh, there are different interpretations of the Messiah, as you know, between Christians and Jewish, but this, this was in a period of time, the Second Temple, when there were a, was a whole lot of turmoil within Judaism. You know, uh, we know from the, from the New Testament, we know that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were at each other's throats about uh, was there a resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees supported it, the, the Sadducees opposed it, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot of conflict going on. Uh, and and uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, there's a third group called the Essenes. But, uh, and here's more from the book of Daniel. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This, I'm just trying to give you a sense of this message of Daniel, and that's where the resurrect, that's the verse, uh, verse two about the resurrection of the dead. This book had a powerful impact on the imagination of Jews, which is why, even though it's quite late, it made it into the canon. Remember I gave you the list of 15 writing prophets, three major and 12 minor? Well, Daniel is actually considered a major writing prophet. And uh, so here's the timeline again. Cyrus, Alexander, Daniel about 164. And then of course, Jesus and Paul will be in that green area between zero and 70 at the very end of Second Temple Judaism. There was also this view called apocalyptic Judaism. And why is it significant? That is the idea, not only is there going to be an end time with the resurrection of the dead and uh, the coming of a Messiah with different views on that, but it's coming soon. This is, this is first century Judaism, and, and, and I guess the best example I can give you is that when Jesus uh, arrives on Palm Sunday, right, what happens? The word spread, and everybody starts thinking, oh, this could be the Messiah, this could be the Messiah. That idea that a Messiah was coming soon to change everything, was a very active idea at the time of Jesus and Paul. And in fact, it led, a few years later, to the rebellion against the Romans and the attempt to throw the Romans out, which was a very uh, stupid thing to try to do, because the Romans came in, leveled the temple, and, and really basically tried to destroy Judaism, because they didn't take kindly to anybody rebelling. They didn't care about the religion. They only cared about the rebellion. And the reason it's significant is because both Jesus of Nazareth and Paul of Tarsus were influenced. I do not want to say that they were apocalyptic Jews, but they were influenced by this idea, which was very common in that first century AD. 
I also want to mention the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. The significance here is that, uh, uh, well, I think I can, Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the fools despise wisdom. Uh, Proverbs is very boring when it says over and over again, if you live right, you'll be blessed. If you live wrongly, you'll be punished. And, and that is the essence of Jewish wisdom. However, it raises questions that I'm sure occur to you. Uh, oh, it's similar to Deuteronomy, blessings and curses. But the book of Job adds a lot of nuance. Why do good people suffer? Why do some bad people seem to profit? So, uh, in other words, Job is a, a critique or a con explanation of Proverbs. Proverbs is the standard Judaism. Do good and you'll be rewarded. Do bad and you'll be punished. But uh, the book of Job goes into more nuance. And now we're going to look at the uh, second temple in some detail. The second temple era tends to be ignored by Christians, even in seminary. And I can say that because I went back to find all my notes and I couldn't find any notes about second temple Judaism. There's no Bible books written in other than Daniel, and the book of Daniel is treated like it's a weird book, and it is a weird book. But, uh, but yeah, there are no historical books for that period. And the result is when you come to the end of the, the Old Testament, you end with Malachi, right? And then you jump to Matthew, right? The New Testament. Uh, so we find Jesus in a situation with the Pharisees and Sadducees without any real background about that second temple period. And, and uh, it, I call the second temple period the black hole because there's so little known. I've had to do a year and a half's research trying to understand the second temple and giving you as much as I can but it's a very, uh, that's the 600 year period, the second temple period. So I call it a black hole, but the period is very significant. And of course it's Cyrus, Alexander, Daniel in particular, Alexander the Great. Cyrus was a benevolent dictator. And that meant that he was very tolerant of religion, including letting the Jews go back to Jerusalem. And uh, that's why he did that and let them rebuild their temple because then they were very appreciative, right? And they wouldn't want to rebuild. That's Cyrus the Great, Ezra returning. Now, Xenophon, a Greek writer about 430, uh, wrote a book about Cyrus called the Cyropedia, the education of Cyrus, where he talked about how marvelous Cyrus's policy was, and that was given to Alexander by Aristotle. So Alexander said, hey, that's really a smart idea. So Alexander was also very tolerant. And there's Aristotle, teacher of Alexander, as arranged by Alexander's father, Philip of Macedonia. That's Alexander. So he set out to conquer the Persian Empire to, build, to bring the benefits of Greek culture to the Oriental world. And he really did succeed to an astonishing extent. In particular, he wanted to establish Greek cities. That's the polis throughout the Oriental world. Alexandria in Egypt was the first one, probably most important. Had a huge library, the first public library in the ancient world. The Greek cities were a key part of his plan. They were independent. Each one was a polis with its own voting roles. Each had a gymnasium and an ephibia. That's the school for training young men, including religious instruction in polytheism. 
you can see where that might at some point really uh, uh, rub the Jewish people the wrong way. So these are the Greek cities in Palestine, and you can, if you could understand this, I don't know how easy it is, they're either along the coast and, or they're over on the, the uh, east side of the Jordan River. There's 10 of them over there called the Decapolis, the Greek cities in Transjordan, the other side are called the Decapolis, the 10 cities. But the, the population in between them was staunchly Jewish. And so there was a certain amount of pressure on Jews under Alexander and the Greek leaders. After the death of Alexander, his uh, empire was split. The most important generals were Seleucus and Ptolemy. Uh, uh, Ptolemy became the ruler of Egypt for a uh, number of years. And, and Philadelphia, this uh, Ptolemy II Philadelphus translated the Septuagint, the uh, Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And you can see here uh, Ptolemy is in Egypt, that's the brown area, and the Seleucids are, are up above it because they eventually took control of, you can see it here, the area of Judea under this. And then there came, for reasons that are way too complicated, but at a certain point, the Greeks in charge of Judea got very upset with the, uh, what they considered the old-fashioned Greeks and all of their strange customs, right? Not eating pork or circumcision. And they tried to ban Judaism. They banned circumcision. They put a statue of Zeus in the temple. They forced Jews to eat pork. I mean, this was, and that, uh, he lost, launched an intensive persecution of Jewish practices, 168 to 165. It generated a rebellion by the scribes and the Hasidim, the loyal ones, and it caused the Maccabean revolt. This is Judas Maccabeus, gave the scribes and common people a leader. His big success was ending the ban of fighting on the Sabbath. Because people found out to conquer the Jews, since they wouldn't fight on the Sabbath, you attack them on the Sabbath. And the Maccabees finally said, you know, enough of that. We're not going to honor the Sabbath in that way. This is Simon Maccabeus, Jonathan Maccabeus, John Hyrcanus, a high priest. This is a book. But uh, anyway, Alexander is trying to bring the benefits of Greece to the east, and, uh, and Book of Daniel was written at a time of extreme persecution that we just talked about, and it led to the Maccabean Rebellion, and the Book of Daniel had a huge impact on Judaism. It was one of many apocalyptic books, but it's the one in the official Old Testament canon, just like there's only one in the New Testament canon, which is the Book of Revelation. And it's the only direct mention of resurrection of the dead. So here's Daniel, and Daniel in the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, apocalyptic Judaism, the apocalypse named after the one in the New Testament, but that's a Christian apocalypse. Daniel is a Jewish apocalypse. Okay. See, both Christianity and Judaism prefer to avoid the Second Temple. They would just assume it didn't exist. Judaism, because their religion changed to rabbinic Judaism, and they would like to say that rabbinic Judaism goes all the way back to David. You know, that it's unchanged. It wasn't unchanged, there were a lot of changes. But Christianity would just as soon pretend that Judaism is rabbinic Judaism, 
because it makes their job of evangelism easier. But the fact is, in this first century, the last years of Second Temple Judaism, there was just a huge amount of turmoil. You know, the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was, a lot of things were up for grabs that we tend to feel were, oh, they, these were all settled. Mm -hmm. and, and Judaism went in two different directions. One was to rabbinic Judaism, and the other was to the Christians who believed Jesus was the Messiah. Now, the one thing I know about you is when you saw the entire Bible for everybody from atheists to Christian believers, it attracted you enough to sign up. And I thank you. No, I really, but, but you know, in other words, there's people out there with this set of questions. And the best I can do is assemble all the information I have and try to explain it as well as I can. And uh, I, I mean, everybody knows where I come from, right? I'm a Christian <laughs> pastor. So, but, but I think Christians have to be able to talk to atheists and agnostics and skeptics. And to talk to them, you have to talk their language, which is the language of science. So that's my dedication. I want to explain this thing, all of the Bible, in scientific language. All right, I think we've had enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs>